Uh, hello, everybody. It's the last talk. I don't, I don't want to take too much of your time um, and prevent you from beer. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so my name is Mert, and I work at Google Cloud Platform front end. Um, specifically, I work on common components. We'll get to what that means in a bit. A um, little bit background about Google Cloud Platform. In, we have huge code base, 600 or so Angular JS directives. In 2016, we started migrating these to um, Angular 2, and it's like every year I hear somebody say it's, it's going to be this year we're going to be done, but it's been like two years now. So, and we have the co both code base going on, but now we have both large Angular JS code base and large Angular 2 code base, which 2,000 components and thousands of services and so on. So my team specifically builds common components that are used across all pages um, at GCP. So let me show you what that looks like. Um, so we have like across that, out of all those 2,000 components, only 100 of them or so are common in a sense that it's like in all pages. So for example, we have a table component, which does crazy things like um, some overflow handling and um, observables and all that stuff. And it has filtering that can talk to our backends, that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, it has columns chooser. But yeah, this is just one instance. We have about 100 or so components um, that our team either authored or it's just currently owned. So before we go much deeper into performance, let me quickly categorize all the components we have. Um, top priority for, uh, for us when we're improving performance of components was that we improve performance of those who are list like table, tree, select, that kind of stuff. And we also improve the performance of components that go inside of those list like components, like icon, button, menu. You notice the um, these things are not ex exclusive. So like menu is both list like a component and can appear within a table. So when the last category is the components that are not list like or don't go in list like components. So these are date picker dialogue. It's not horrible if these components are inefficient because there's just few of them on the page, unless they're horribly inefficient. Um, having said that, let's try to categorize the performance issues we saw too. Um, performance issues could be rendering problems. These are relatively easy to um, debug and fix. This DOM nesting and CSS nesting is one of the major ones. Could be scripting problems. This, this can range from anywhere from change detection inefficiency or misuse of observables. And memory problems are Hard, a little harder to debug than these can be caused by sharing that data incorrectly or um, using unnecessary directives. Um, so all the uh, pitfalls I'm going to share are going to be, I'm going to be sharing pitfalls about all three, really. So let's just go straight into one of them, which is my favorite, is calling detect changes. Um, so Angular does provides this detect changes API, um, but it really shouldn't be used unless you're using it with detach and reattach and that kind of stuff. In most cases, you are using it left and right without knowing that this detect changes is synchronous. So if you do it in a click event handler, it, um, it basically blocks your uh, click until Angular executes the full change detection across all subtree of components. But if you call mark for check, it's better because it's synchronous. You can call mark for check thousands of times on the same component, and it, Angular won't do anything about it until it gets a chance to execute in the next tick. Um, also, there's a couple other problems with the tech changes that while it's parent to child relationships, um, and it's inefficient. Um, so avoid that. Um, one other, like a quick, so. Before we go into these pitfalls a little bit more, I want to emphasize that 
most of the pitfalls I, I've been talking about is just these two two subcategories of components, which are like a list-like or the components that go on list-like components. If you have a component that has a few instances on the page, it's probably fine that you call the tech changes on it. That's that should be okay. Um, so, for example, ng class. Um, so this is like an example of where we use Angular too much for, um, or unnecessarily. Um, like if you want to set a class on a component, don't use ng class. Just use a class attribute directly, or even interpolation is better because it's a single binding. When you use ng class each time, this component has a uh, directive has um, iterable differ object, each one associated with it. Which it does is um, tries to find the difference between two objects or arrays. So like if you look at how iterable differs operate, it basically uses complex data structures, like maps, lists, all kinds of crazy data, and array to just figure out what happened. And this is really needed when things like, if you consider things like ng4, because you don't want to be creating your views too often. But in this case, we don't really care about, you know, iterable differs or anything. We just want to set one class, and you can do that in the binding. Um, same thing applies to ng style. Don't use it if you don't need to. Again, this is probably fine if you use it in a date picker or something, but if you do it in a table cell, which has, I don't know, thousands of rows, you could create thousands of iterable differs, and that will uh, create both memory and CPU inefficiency for you. This is a little controversial one, uh, but <coughs> try to avoid ng4. So ng4 also uses iterable differs. Um, and if you think about how the ng4 is implemented, you think that material table or CDK table would use it left and right, but they're not using that. What they're doing instead is create embedded views um, to create the view and then manage it uh, since they know the data is going to be immutable. Like they don't really care, uh, change the items after initialization, or if they do, they can just create, uh, know which ones that have changed. So it's just something to think about. Um, if you don't have to use it, um, don't use it, I'd say. Um, if you don't, if you do need to use ng4, watch out, for, don't, don't use ng template with an ng4. What Angular does is, Angular will try to create an ng template. I don't want to say, like, I want to say instance, because it's basically like an ng template factory. It, it can split up multiple ng templates. Um, but Angular will try to create uh, ng template factory per item if you use it within ng4. But you can always, in all cases, could put the ng template outside of ng4. Um, so do that um, instead of putting it inside of ng4. Otherwise, it will create a CPU inefficiency. So one thing that we have discovered is like observables are super dangerous sometimes. Like we had a table where we were subscribing to all cells in the table and watching for updates. Instead, when we discovered that we can only we do, we only need care about the updates on our visible cells, uh, we reduced we reduced the CPU overhead by almost fifty percent. Um, and to show that, let me show you this cool tool Michael, the co-host of this event, built for us. This is a perf gate which lets us watch script time or any other like a metric over time of a component. And this shows us the changeless numbers. It will show a sharp drop here. Between these points is my CL, I think, which made it drop 2.5 seconds um, because we were uh, watching all the cells in a table. It's kind of like no brainer when you think about it, but while we were first initially coding it, oh, it's just subscribe to changes and if there's a change update, but something to think about. Um, I put the the perfect link here too, just um, so that people who don't have access to the URL will see it later. Um, another anti-pattern, <coughs> when you're using list-like component, try not to create components within list-like components. Um, so like if you have a table component, don't create a cell component because 
that will just increase DOM nesting. So it will create a DOM um, element per cell, which is not what you want in general. Um, but if you made, made it uh, as a directive instead, um, you can realize some rendering gains, which we tried this out and it, uh, it improved our table performance by 15%. Um, so it's just um, one pitfall I could imagine. Um, this is, um, so, okay, avoid, um, avoid too many event listeners uh, on the DOM. So it really feels like correct angular to create the event listener per component, like material tooltip does this too, where if you mouse over a tooltip, uh, if you mouse over a button that contains a tooltip, just show the tooltip, right? It feels natural, but if you have like, let's say tooltips per cell, um, you'll see this will slow down the re rendering of the page because you're missing one major point, which is that events do bubble up. So like if you had a one event listener document level, you could differentiate event, uh, the, the target from event.target and basically just have one listener instead of many per page. Um, and unfortunately, this is something material tooltip implementation is also missing. We changed our, our tooltip implementation uh, locally and we seen that 9% improvement in script time because of the number of event, just sheer number of event listeners we were registering. Um, so, but I think material team is gonna update this soon. So it's not, not something you need to worry about. Um, this is not really Angular <coughs> problem, but in general, there's like list of attributes that force Chrome to do layout. It might be super dangerous if you access these attributes within leaf level components that go in your list like components. So one instance we were, we had an expanding row component, which let me show you because it's, <clears throat> the name is not really um, explanatory. We had a, this component which we used to display stream of data. It does this, not much. Um, but <clears throat> we were accessing offset height at some point. And we, when we changed it to do something a little smarter, uh, we saw like rendering time drop almost 80% um, because purely because we were forcing Chrome to do layout every time we access offset height and we were accessing it in a child component of expanding row component. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, the slide about that. Um, this is my last slide. Um, this is a, just a re, kind of le recap of some of the previous slides I had, but avoid DOM heavy components in list like components. So like instead of mat checkbox, we use mat soda checkbox, um, which showed uh, get, uh, made us gain like 8% in rendering time. And the way we did it uh, was very simple actually, because we were using we replaced the math sort of checkbox, but we also added like the correct accessibility attributes like ARIA, role, and so on. And the improvement was kind of intuitive because if you look at the DOM for math checkbox, you'll see something like this. Let me close. Oh, oh there I go. Okay. Um, let me try to present again because I closed the tab. Basically, you'll see that um, the dome of matte checkbox is um, super heavy. Um, so like you, you'll see hundreds of, well, hundreds is too much, but maybe like 20 or so um, bindings and also the uh, child directives like matte ripple, which initialize on uh, ng on init, which is not what you want in general. But if you look at the templates for matte, check, uh, matte soda checkbox, um, you'll see that it doesn't have a template. It basically is a single element and it, whatever you give it kind of tries to display a simple checkbox. So just keep in mind, uh, when you're using DOM heavy, uh, DOM heavy, uh, components within list like components, it's, uh, it can really slow down your page. That's pretty much it for me, unless you have 
Any other questions? Then, uh, well. Yeah, these will be available on the link as well. Yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> oh, thanks. Glad it's helpful. Is there a point at which the end user is going to start noticing differences based on making these changes? Like, differences like based on the scale of how big your app or your site is? Yeah, like, um, pretty much when we were at the stage where we needed to improve our table performance, we realized it wasn't even opening an Internet Explorer. But, like, so we had to change that. Um, and even when it opens on Chrome, like, when I, when I talked about 50% improvement, those are usually visible or, or noticeable by a user because it's, like, if it's a five-second... Uh, load time, it becomes two second load time. Although I, I'd say it probably wouldn't matter if your page is really small. Um, I guess I'm just so. trying to get an idea of the scale. Like if I've got an app that's got like a list of say a dozen or two dozen items, how much of a difference am I want to see versus how hard is it to do some of these things? Yeah, uh, I don't think a dozen or two dozen items, like I don't think that will, um, you you need to optimize performance that much in that case because it's like only less than hundred components or so I imagine, um, but it like it adds up as you build up your page. Sometimes there are menus right like you want to show a menu that has maybe fifty items but it's hidden. Um, <clears throat> watch out for that case because material menu and select implementations will initialize a component before you actually need the menu. So like things like that could add up, but if it's just a dozen or so, I don't think you'd need to optimize performance that much. Cool. So uh, should this improvements be packaged in a higher level component? Like a table that is bound by the data source and the field, the columns can be bound properties of the data source. Right. Instead of having all developers suffer the pain. Let me just have a lesson. Yeah. Um, so that was, that's what a material table component tries to do. But the problem with the material table component is that it doesn't do anything. That's why it's super fast. <laughs> um, so like if you look at material data, like a lot of questions, I always get questions from Angular team is like, oh, why didn't you use our table component? It's mostly because that ta their table component is, doesn't do anything we needed it to do. Like we want like tool tips. We want, I don't know, to, to be able to talk to backends. We, we want filter box, column chooser, pagination, all that stuff. Um, or like even radio buttons. And it's ideally we would want to open source these our components. It's just we haven't gotten to that stage yet and these are all internal to Google. So. Cool. Unless there are no more questions. Set. <laughs>